I had a strong feeling that Kamala Harris was going to lose. Not because of how the polls tightened during the last few weeks before the election, nor was it because I thought Donald Trump was a strong candidate. I actually had the premonition of what would be the catastrophic outcome of the 2024 presidential race after I read Harris's speech at the Democratic National Convention back in August. It really wasn't what she said, it's what she didn't say. In her speech at the 2024 DNC, can you guess how many times Kamala Harris criticized corporations, Wall Street, the wealthy, or the wealthiest 1%? Or how many times she spoke about the plight of the poor, or poverty? Or how many times she said she would address inequality or inequity? The answer for all these questions is sadly zero. Kamala Harris did not use any of these words even once in her speech at the DNC. It was a departure from Democratic presidential candidates in the past cycles who have at least paid some lip service to these populist themes and used these terms several times when accepting the nomination at their respective conventions. In his speech at the 2012 Democratic National Convention, Barack Obama explicitly went after corporations, Wall Street, and millionaires using these specific words three times each. In 2016, Hillary Clinton criticized corporations and Wall Street twice respectively, while also mentioning that there's too much inequality. At the 2020 Democratic Convention, Joe Biden talked about inequity as well as having the wealthiest 1% pay their fair share. He made the point at least twice in his speech. Harris's campaign, in contrast, was devoid of any clear populist vision. And this, in my assessment, was a crippling blunder because it ignored the fact that right now, the vast majority of Americans within both political parties claim to hate corporate elites more than ever. This has been a trend in recent years. In 2019, 63% of Republicans had a positive view of banks and the financial industry. But today in 2024, that number has dropped to 38%, which brings it to the same exact level as that for Democratic voters. The view of large corporations saw a similar decline, dropping in favorability rating from 54% among Republicans in 2019 to 32% now. Amid this growing antagonism towards banks and large corporations, Kamala Harris would have done better to place the focus of her campaign on the need to take on corporate America. This might have given Harris the chance to win over working class Republicans and Republican-leaning independent voters. With banks and large corporations now hated more than ever from both sides of the political spectrum, Harris would have had bipartisan support by running as a populist. She could have siphoned more votes away from Donald Trump by focusing on the abuses of the wealthiest 1%. But instead, Harris ran a baffling campaign. Rather than trying to win over moderate Republicans by going after the ultra-rich, she touted the endorsements of people like Liz and Dick Cheney. Despite the headlines these endorsements made, the fact remains that Liz Cheney lost her re-election bid for Congress in 2022, winning just 28% of the primary vote. Her father left the vice presidency with an even more miserable 13% approval rating. As the journalist David Sirota pointed out, Dick Cheney left office 16 years ago with the same disapproval rating as Richard Nixon when he left office. Harris publicly touting Cheney's endorsement is the political equivalent of Bill Clinton running for president in 1992 and deciding to publicly tout Nixon's endorsement. Clearly, support from the Cheneys did not trigger a rush of Republican voters for Harris. And, in hindsight, it's a wonder that anyone ever thought it would. But this is only one instance of the failure of the Harris campaign to seize a real opportunity to attract voters who ordinarily side with the Republicans. As the results of the election now make it clear, Kamala Harris ran a disastrous campaign, one that was arguably worse than Hillary Clinton's bid back in 2016. So here we are once again, with the billionaire reality TV star Donald Trump stumbling into the White House. And if he was ever capable of giving credit where credit is due, Trump would have to thank the incompetence of the Democratic Party for his win. In the coming months, there will be a lot of finger pointing on who or what to blame for this easily avoidable scenario. Some will blame racism, given Trump's xenophobic rhetoric against immigrants, which was certainly real. But then they will have to explain why, for the first time, so many voters of color flipped to voting Republican. 
Others will point out Harris's reluctance to break away from Biden's foreign policy and not supporting an arms embargo on Israel, which definitely played a major factor. I covered this very topic on a previous video on this channel, and one YouGov poll conducted weeks before the election found that 57% of Biden 2020 voters in Pennsylvania who are undecided or voting for another candidate said they'll be more likely to vote for Kamala Harris if she pledged an arms embargo on Israel. 0% said they'll be less likely. But this election was first and foremost about the economy, with voters ranking it as the number one issue. Yes, under President Biden, unemployment has gone down, inflation has stabilized, and GDP is up. But at the same time, food insecurity has reached its highest levels in a decade. Homelessness also attained record highs in 2023, with evictions in certain cities now higher than pre-pandemic levels. Childhood poverty has skyrocketed from 5-12% to in just one year. And never since the Great Depression have so many young people returned to live with their parents, as they can't afford to buy homes on their own. What used to be a hallmark of the American dream is now like a dot in the rear view mirror, with the medium age of home buyers at a shocking 53 years. On the other end of the life cycle, grandparents can no longer afford to retire, with those 75 or older making the fastest growing age group in the workforce. And, as life expectancy in the US dips to age 76, the lowest since 1996, these people will likely die while still working, never having the means to retire to enjoy their golden years. Yet, various pundits haven't been able to grasp how bad the economic situation has been under President Biden. Of course, not everything terrible about the economy is Biden's fault, but the consensus within the liberal intelligentsia is that there's not even a problem at all. Opinion writers such as Aaron Rupar and David Brooks believe that Biden wasn't getting the credit he deserves over the supposed improvements in the economy. MSNBC contributor Steve Bennon wrote that, As election day nears, Dems have a great economic story to tell. Political writer Michael Grunwald wrote an op-ed titled, Everything is awesome again, with the sub-headline saying that things are actually going pretty well in America. And Harris might want to consider admitting that. Many experts seem baffled by the economic indicators that weren't getting traction with the general public. Democratic pollster Celinda Lake was mystified that things are getting better and people think that things are going to get worse. And Paul Krugman, who believed the economy is surreally good, argued that America's negative perception is a very large part of it is partisanship or tribalism rather than an actual perception. But he ignores the fact that nearly half of Democrats believe the economy is now under recession. Perhaps it was the outsized influence of some liberal commentators that played a hand in shaping Kamala Harris's messaging. As long as everything is fine according to them, there was no reason for Harris to try to differentiate herself from Biden's economic record. Of course, Harris talked about the economy from time to time, but it never became the central focus of her campaign. In not doing so, her campaign represents a departure from the approaches of past Democratic presidential candidates. Compare Harris's 2024 campaign to Barack Obama's successful re-election in 2012, and you will find a huge contrast in the type of messaging utilized between these two candidates. As an illustration of this, let me show you what I found when analyzing 30 commercials from Kamala Harris's 2024 race and 30 from Barack Obama's 2012 campaign. From watching these 60 ads, I can tell you that their respective emphasis on the economy was quite stark. Out of the 30 Kamala Harris commercials, only 7 specifically mentioned an economic issue, fewer than a quarter of the total. To her credit, there was one effective ad on cracking down on price gouging, and there was another decent one on tax cuts to the middle class, but neither of these proposals became a centerpiece of her ad campaign. Instead, Harris had four other ads devoted to clamping down on the so-called border crisis, and eight more featured never-Trump Republican officials or voters endorsing Harris. Most of these lacked any concrete policy issues and often relied on messages that Trump was a threat to democracy. Meanwhile, two-thirds of the ad for Barack Obama in 2012 were about some economic issue, 20 out of the 30. There were commercials that featured past accomplishments such as how Obama saved the auto industry and signed a bill to ensure women are paid the same amount as men, 
When attacking his Republican opponent, the ads focused on how Mitt Romney's policies would give tax breaks to the rich and offshore more jobs from the United States. And even in ads that were not centered on the economy, such as one on the environment and energy policy, Obama still incorporated a populist message about how big oil supported Romney. In other words, Harris's problem was that her messaging was mixed, embracing various different themes. Sometimes her ads were about the border, other times they were about Trump's threat to democracy, but there was no central argument on why she should be elected. Her campaign should have just copied Obama's 2012 playbook, which was more disciplined and hammered home an economic theme that resonated with swing voters in a way that Harris's scattershot messaging did not. There is evidence that an Obama-like approach would have been more effective. For instance, weeks before the election, the Center for Working Class Politics and YouGov surveyed 1,000 registered voters in Pennsylvania and tested seven different types of Democratic messaging to see which one had more traction among the respondents. What they discovered was that strong populism and progressive economics messages performed the strongest, while immigration control didn't perform nearly as well. Significantly, Trump's democracy threat underperformed the most and turned off the respondents. This means means Harris would have had her best shot if she had scrapped all her campaign ads on immigration and the threats to democracy and went all in on populist proposals for fixing the economy. Of course, many will rush to point out that Harris could not run on this issue because, as the vice president under Joe Biden, she bore responsibility for the poorly viewed economy. But this ignores the fact that the economy was also poorly viewed when Obama ran for re-election in 2012. Then, as today, most Americans thought the economy was in recession. Yet, President Obama didn't run away from the issue of the economy, he instead ran on it. He did so mainly by painting his opponent as an out-of-touch elitist who was incapable of solving the problems of the middle class and would only make the situation worse. Harris had an easier opening to do this than Obama did in 2012. Mitt Romney might have been wealthy, but Donald Trump is a literal billionaire who signed into law one of the largest tax breaks in generations for the benefit of the wealthiest 1% of Americans. So, in spite of the challenges posed by her associations with Biden's economy, Harris could still have run a campaign campaign centered on the economic concerns of the American voters. She could have done, for example, what Gretchen Whitmer did two years ago in her campaign for re-election as Michigan governor. Whitmer emphasized how the economy was not working for everyday people and she coupled her promise of change with an explicit acknowledgement of the legitimate suffering of her constituents. She began one campaign ad, for instance, with the following words. Everything is going up. The cost of gas, childcare, even a box of cereal costs four bucks. Look, I can't solve the inflation problem, but we're doing things right now to help. And after this, Whitmer went on to list the accomplishments she had made to try to alleviate the problem. It was a brilliant message because she acknowledged the pain of the voters. She was not trying to gaslight the public into thinking that inflation wasn't real or trying to correct their perceptions with expert economic analysis about how it was technically being curved. Instead, Whitmer honestly recognized the problem and went from there to address how she would fix it. In the end, Whitmer won re-election by increasing her margins from her 2018 race, which, it bears remembering, was a blue wave year. She turned a former Trump state more democratic than New York in 2022, in a red wave year. If Harris had framed the economic situation in the same way Whitmer did, she could have easily introduced various populist proposals to get people excited to vote for her. Yet, what economic promises did she run on? Was it fixing or reducing inequality? Unfortunately, neither on her website or on her 82-page policy document did she use the word inequality even once. Is it driving down tuition costs? Incredibly, it was Trump, not Harris, who mentioned this topic on his website. While it's highly doubtful that he will ever fulfill that promise, Trump at least bothered to mention the issue. Harris's website, on the other hand, had nothing to say about tuition. Is there a mention of a public option to lower the cost of our healthcare system? That was something that the Biden campaign promised back in 2020. Again, Harris was silent. Harris had, instead, a strange proposal on her website about supporting a regulatory framework for cryptocurrency and other digital assets so black men who invest in and own these assets are protected. 
When most people just want higher wages and better healthcare, I can't imagine how an arcane pro crypto policy was supposed to generate much excitement among voters. The reason why polls show that a slight majority of Americans thought Trump would be better on the economy has nothing to do with anything he actually did the last time as president. In fact, there are even reputable studies showing that Trump's massive tax cuts to the rich exacerbated the inflation crisis. No. The explanation for the widely shared idea that Trump would be better on the economy is because he talked about it more often than Harris did. While Harris said the word jobs twice in her speech at the Democratic National Convention, Trump said it at least 13 times in his acceptance speech at the Republican National Convention. Trump also said the words economic or economy 13 times in his speech, while Harris only used these words just three times. At their one debate, Harris only mentioned inflation twice, while Trump said it nine times. Even if Trump has no solutions for creating jobs or stabilizing inflation, just by talking about it more, he created a false perception among voters that he is the candidate best suited to fixing the economy. Of course, Donald Trump will not fix the economy. As food insecurity is skyrocketing, he will likely make even further cuts to food stamps, just as the Republicans in control of Congress did in 2023 when 30 million Americans got their benefits slashed. Trump will also crack down on the power of organized labor, just as he did back in 2018 when he disempowered 2 million federal employee union workers by restricting their collective bargaining rights. And it's the blue collar, older generation of Americans who support Trump who are likely to get hit hard, as Trump suggested multiple times that he will cut social security and Medicare. In the end, Donald Trump did not win because he was a populist, but Kamala Harris did lose against the most beatable Republican candidate imaginable by running away from a populist agenda. Perhaps there is no reason for Democrats now to self-reflect. After all, if their biggest fears turn out to be true, the United States is about to turn into an authoritarian dictatorship and this has been the last presidential election of our lifetime. But one thing is certain. The economic situation is about to get significantly worse. More Americans will go hungry. More families will be living on the street. The rich will get richer and the poor poorer. If democracy ends up being saved, the Democrats will need to reevaluate their entire strategy and wage a campaign of class warfare. It's not just to their electoral benefit, but they will also have the moral obligation to do so.